All right, this morning, let's read now the, the account of the announcement of the birth of Christ to Joseph by the angel in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And really, uh, we're going to focus, as I've already told you, mainly on verse 21, but certainly verse 23 is also very important for what we're going to be examining this morning. Well... Matthew writes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. When he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Uh, one thing we should note is, is just how the angel in both cases point out to Mary and to Joseph, you, you are to call him Jesus, because contained in that name is really everything we're going to be looking at today and everything he was sent into the world to do. Now, let me begin by saying something, you know, again, that we all understand. Christmas is, is a very special time of the year, and I think it is for most people in this world. It's almost as if at this season, the words of the, uh, of the angels to the shepherds, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, somehow those words get through to us at this time when they don't towards others. We, we tend to forget about things that divide us. You know, there's, there's more peace. We're more forgiving toward those who have hurt us and I think more willing to overlook each other's faults especially as we think about how God has overlooked ours uh, through the Lord Jesus. We also seem to be more willing to give. We gather our families together in order to celebrate and, and to share in meals. We exchange gifts with our loved ones and our friends. I think at this time we're also more likely to give to charity, to those who are struggling simply to survive. And that's why we see so many Salvation Army bell ringers, you know, standing in front of the stores at this time of year because they know that we are going to be more inclined to give. Now, it has been pointed out to us that many of our Christmas traditions actually don't come from the Bible and uh, they really come from pagan traditions, the origins of some of them. And we also know it's very unlikely, I'd say extremely un unlikely, that Jesus was actually born at this time of the year. But I don't think we want to miss the point that, that God seems uniquely to bless this season. He seems to intend it as a continuing witness to the greatest gift that He has given and really that He could possibly give, that of His Son. So this morning, our attention is again drawn to this gift, and I really want us to look at two things today that I've already mentioned. I want us to think first about the value of this gift, and this evening, I want us to see how this gift, who is Jesus, how it is that He brings to us eternal life, how He does everything necessary to make sure that you and I are going to make it to heaven. Now let's begin by considering His value. And that's, again, something we can take for granted, I think, as we read the pages of Scripture, as we think about Jesus. Sometimes we get maybe a little bit too familiar with Him, and we need to see Him as He really is. Now, I think two things can help us to see that value. The first is 
in the debt that we owed that he was able to pay. And secondly, in his personal worth, which is what enables him to do this. So let's consider first the debt that he paid. In our passage, we heard the angel say to Joseph in verse 21, she, that is Mary, your betrothed, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus has a meaning. This name the angel gave on both occasions explains why he was actually sent into the world. I think we know that Jesus is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew name Joshua. You know, it's interesting that there's an Old Testament character by the name of Joshua who uh, is a picture of Christ who comes into the world in order to basically uh, defeat God's enemies. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing for us. The name itself is really a sentence in Hebrew. It means the Lord or Yahweh or Yah, that's where we get the, the Yah in Joshua, is salvation, is Shua or our salvation. Joseph was to call him Jesus. Mary was to call him Jesus because God sent him into the world in order to save. Now the angel further tells Joseph who it was he was to save his people. Now this limits, doesn't it, uh, the, the mission upon which he sends Jesus into the world because contrary to popular belief, Jesus wasn't sent into the world to save everyone. The Bible does not teach universalism. Not everybody's going to be saved and it doesn't teach a universal redemption. Jesus didn't actually lay down his life for everyone. Now, we do know that he was sent to save people from every nation. It's universal in that sense. But not all, not everyone from every nation. Jesus came to save his people, those whom the Father chose to give him. Jesus tells us in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me. Those are those for whom he lays down his life. He says in John 10, verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. And we know in that same discourse, Jesus goes on to tell his enemies, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. The sheep are those the Father has given Jesus. Those that he says in the same discourse who hear his voice and who follow him. Verses 27 and 28, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. Again, that is not everyone. That is a select group of people and the way we know who those people are is they hear the voice of Christ, they trust in Him, and they follow Him. And that's exactly what Jesus meant when He said in that most famous verse in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. You see, when, they, when it comes down to evangelism, and yet, yes, it's important, that God chose and those people whom he chose are going to be saved. But as far as evangelism is concerned and the people who hear the gospel, all they need to know is that if they want Jesus, they can come to Jesus and he will give them eternal life. He will save them. So there's no excuse. And the only reason why they wouldn't come is because they don't want to come. Now the point this morning I want us to see is this that in sending Jesus into the world, God sent him into the world for us. If we are believing in him, if we are trusting in him, what he came to do was to save us. He came to save us from that which threatened us. He came to save us from our sins. Now the word sin means to miss the mark. It means to depart from what is right. John tells us that sin is lawlessness, and what that means is it is a violation of the law, and that is, of course, 
the law of God. Now, Paul tells us that we have all broken God's law. We have all failed to live up to the standard. And so we all fall short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that we broke the commandments, first of all, in Adam, when he disobeyed God's commandments. Paul writes, through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. But we need to realize that we're not only guilty of Adam's sin, but we have followed his example throughout our lives from the time we came into the world. We have broken God's commandments many times. And that's why, you know, sin is in Scripture, said to be universal among all mankind because in Adam we all sinned, because we all come into the world conceived and born in sin. And that's why Solomon, when he was dedicating the temple, and let's not forget that the temple worship at that time was the only way that a person could be reconciled to God. They had to have the priests offer sacrifices on their behalf. They had to look through those sacrifices to Christ and believe in Him. And if they did, they would be saved. But that was the only way. And when he was dedicating the temple, he prayed this in 1 Kings 8.46. He says, when your people sin against you. He doesn't say if they sin against you, but he says when they sin against you. For there is no man who does not sin. So Solomon recognizing they're all going to sin. We all sin. If they repent and return in their hearts and pray towards this place, then hear their prayers and forgive them. The psalmist in Psalm 130 verse 3 says this, if, Lord, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, that is, sins, if you should take all those things into account, if you should call every man to stand before you, O oh Lord, who could stand? Well, the implied answer is, of course, no one could because we are all guilty of breaking God's commandments. John tells us in 1 John 1, 8, if we, if we think for a moment that that isn't true of us, we're simply deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. We have all sinned. Now the question is, well, again, Jesus came into the world to save us from our sins. The question is, well, just how serious are these sins? How serious is our disobedience to God's commandments? Well, God tells us that the breaking of his commandments, really any of them, not loving him and treating him as God, as our God, you know, not having him as God is first in our lives, not worshiping Him, worshiping Him as He calls us to do in His Word, breaking our promises to Him, not resting on His Sabbaths so that we can worship Him, not loving our neighbor as Jesus loved His neighbor, even doing this in our desires, in the desires of our hearts, in our minds, just thinking about these things and wanting to do them or speaking about them, wanting to do these things, even the smallest of our sins, the Bible says, deserves endless and unbearable suffering. Because every single one of these things is a direct act of disobedience against the one who is infinitely holy and infinitely worthy. I, he I heard... Um, R.C. Sproul one time used this uh, illustration, which I think kind of helps us see why this is the case. He says, if we were to strike our neighbor, then we would become liable to, to the law, essentially, to make restitution for the damage we've done to our neighbor. If we were to strike the president, well, then it kind of ups the ante. You would immediately be arrested and put in prison and put on trial, probably public trial, because the higher an, a person's office the greater the offense. Now, if that's true, he reasoned, then what do the offenses that we commit against God deserve? Even those committed against the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we're going to be reminded in a moment is God. Well, he said to scratch the Lord Jesus would be a greater crime than taking Abraham Lincoln and putting him to death by inches. In other words, torturing him until he dies, because Jesus is infinitely more worthy. Well, the fact is, we have committed many such offenses against an infinitely holy 
God. The Bible says that the wages of sin, that is what God's court of justice demands for our crimes against him, is death. Now, it's not just physical death. If that's all it was, if we just simply ceased to exist, Jonathan Edwards reminds us that we would actually never know what our punishment was. We would just simply be oblivious because we wouldn't exist anymore. It's not just physical death, but it is judicial death. Separation from God, separation from His blessedness, separation into eternal and unbearable punishment. Now that is what our sins deserve. Separation from God because we have committed sins, our sins are committed against an infinite God. Now that is how serious our sin is. But the first point is simply this. We see the worth of this gift that Jesus has given to us or that the Father has given to us in Jesus in that he was able to pay this debt. Of a multitude which no one can actually number, who have committed a multitude of sins which nobody can number. Any one of those sins is an infinite crime. But Jesus was able to pay for those, for all those people and all those sins. That's how valuable, that's how worthy he is. By the way, he's the only one who could have done this. So this is how great the gift is that God has given to us. Now secondly, Jesus is able to pay this because of his personal worth. He's the only one who could do this. Now, we probably don't think about this very often, if, if at all. I, I hope we have actually meditated on this. But God did not have to save us. He could have left all of us in our guilt. He could have made all of us pay for our own crimes. And he would have been perfectly just if he had chosen to do that. God's justice demands that payment be made. But it doesn't demand that he be the one who actually pays it. The only reason he did it was because of his infinite love and mercy and grace that is in and of himself. It wasn't because he looked at our poor you know, situation and saw how miserable we were and he was moved by that because we're actually infinitely obnoxious in the sight of God in our sins. It's because of the love that is in God's heart that he was moved with compassion to show mercy to us. Okay, He didn't have to do it, but he did out of love. But having determined that he would do this, there was only one way that he could do it, only one way. God must become a man. You know, it's interesting that during the Middle Ages, I'm not sure if, um, if, you were, if Godfrey brought this up during the Middle Ages, but he said a lot of interesting questions were asked. Could God have redeemed us by sending his son into the world to become a lamb? or to become a donkey, or some other creature besides a man? And the answer was no, because man is the one who owed the debt. The one who had to pay it must be a man. We disobeyed God. Adam broke his law. We broke that law in Adam. We've broken it every single day of our lives. We are the ones who owe the debt. And so we are the ones who must pay the debt. That is, mankind owes the debt. So Jesus became one of us. That's what the incarnation is all about. He became a man. He became a human being so that he could pay the debt from our side. The angel said to Joseph in Matthew 1, verses 20 and 21, the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. So he had to become one with us in order to pay the debt because we owed the debt. But because the debt is so great, as we've seen, because we've committed infinite crimes against an infinitely holy God, Jesus has to be more than a man. He has to be God. By the way, this is an apologetic, okay? We were, as we were going through the apologetic series, we were reminded that uh, once we prove the Bible is the Word of God, then we have the standard by which we can begin to prove all the other points of Christianity. There are many people out there who do not believe that Jesus is God. 
Okay, this is an apologetic uh, to prove that He is. And the first reason we have to believe that He is God is because only God could pay the debt that we owed to God. Well, that's exactly, again, what we've seen happen. And that's why verses 22 and 23 of our text are important. Matthew tells us, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. That's again, Emmanuel is another sentence in Scripture, in this case perhaps a phrase, God with us. And what it means is he is literally with us. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7, Although he, that is Jesus, existed in the form of God, and the only one who exists in the form of God is God, did not regard equality with God, and again, the only one who is equal with God is God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. By the way, he didn't empty himself of his divinity but rather of his status, as it were, his reputation by taking something infinitely less than himself, being made into a man. God took our nature to himself that he might save us. Now again, our sins deserved eternal suffering because we have offended an infinite being. And by the way, let me just mention, even after we come to Christ, and are saved by His grace, our sins still deserve infinite suffering, don't they? Because there's still offenses against an infinite being. But thankfully, we will not have to endure that suffering because of what God has done through Jesus. You know, we're reminded by the Westminster Assembly that this is true, so that after we come to Christ, we won't take our sins more lightly. Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You know, each one of those is still an offense to God, but Christ has paid for them all. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died on the cross. He died physically. He, he was dead and buried. And, of course, a reminder, he was raised from the dead. But he also died judicially. He suffered God's wrath on the cross. He bore our sins in his own body and suffered and died in order to fully satisfy our debt and the debt of everyone who trusts in Him. And that's why Jesus says this in John 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the one and only way because he alone is God and man. Man to pay our debt, God, so his, his uh, payment would be valuable enough. If you want God's forgiveness, if you want to receive this gift of eternal life through Christ, you have to come to Jesus. He is the only way. Now, as we prepare to celebrate Christmas you know, by giving gifts to our loved ones and our friends, Let's remember the greatest gift ever given, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And as we do, let's also remember that we owe a debt we can never repay. God calls us to give something back to Him, and that is our love, our worship, our service, our lives, everything we have. It all belongs to Him. That's how we need to see ourselves, not as our own, but rather is His because we've been bought and paid for by this great price. Well, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer, and let's, let's ask the Lord to um, just remind us again of these great things and that it might stir us up to thankfulness to Him.